Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I will ask, so we're five minutes before the official start time of the, the class. Uh, remember there's this uh, Carlton hour that starts five minutes later than, than normal. Um, I'm going to ask you now uh, to confirm that uh, you can hear me. Uh, use YouTube chat to do that. And Okay, thank you. Okay, can someone confirm that there's sound now? All right, good. Thank you for that. Um, so welcome, as I said uh, earlier, we still have a, a couple of minutes before the official start time. Um, so before we start, does anybody have any questions for me? My day is, uh, is going fine, I'm a little bit nervous because this is the first time I'm teaching this, uh, this way. I'm not as keen about remote learning as I am about in-person learning. I don't watch much anime, no. Good morning. So there's approximately a three second delay between the time I speak and at least the time I see myself speaking on, uh, on this tablet. I'm guessing it's about the same for you guys. So, um, so there'll be lots of pausing while I, uh, when I ask for feedback, I'll, I'll wait a few seconds and there'll be a silence that feels awkward, uh, at least for me. Am I a gamer? Uh, not really. I don't have uh, don't have a lot of time for games uh, anymore. Uh, job and children kind of soak up all that uh, that time. So you asked if the lecture is going to be recorded. Yes, uh, this YouTube broadcast is being recorded. But uh, more importantly than that, the um, there's another separate, entirely separate camera recording everything that's happening, uh, and I think it's going to be a slightly better quality, so I will upload that, uh, that video um, within 24 hours. How hard is this course? Uh, that varies depending on the, on the students and, uh, and how much effort they're, they're willing to put in. Um, for some people, it's, uh, it's not a difficult course at all. I would like to keep it, uh, at the very least, sort of approachable, uh, so people don't get discouraged. All right, so now we've reached the actual start time. Um, so I'll go over the course outline and then give you a, 
a sort of a teaser lecture today that covers some of the topics we're, we're going to discuss. Um, so let's, uh, let's remember that this uh, YouTube chat is the only way you guys have of, uh, of asking me questions and it's the only way I have of getting responses from you. Uh, so I do encourage you, if someone mentioned creating a, a Discord, if you want to do uh, chatting outside of, um, on a sideband, that's fine, but please don't uh, clog up the YouTube chat with, uh, with huge discussions, because uh, then I won't actually be able to see any questions that, uh, that come up. So, first off, this is me, Pat Morin. I'm a professor at, uh, at Carleton. I've been a professor for a, a very long time. If you need to call me, um, you can just call me by my first name, Pat. I don't, uh, I don't need any title or anything. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, then you can just avoid uh, calling me by name at all. So you can just ask your question. Uh, it's really easy now since we're in this remote learning setup. Either uh, we'll, we'll be doing a Zoom chat, in which case you'll be right in front of me, you don't have to call me by name, or, uh, or you're just chatting over, uh, over YouTube, in which case uh, you also don't need to, uh, to call me by name. Um, the course is COMP 2804. Uh, here's the web page for the course. I assume that you've found that already because that's really the only way to find the, uh, the YouTube lecture if you're, if you're here. Uh, almost everything we do will be available on this web page, so all the assignments will be there. Uh, you'll see that the, the textbook is there. Uh, sample solutions for the assignments will, will go there. Sample exams and, uh, and so on. The only thing that we'll be using CU Learn for is submitting assignments and probably uh, when it's time to do midterm and final exams, those will somehow be integrated into to see you learn. We'll cross that bridge when we, we come to it. Unlike some other courses, uh, the grading scheme has not changed in the, the online format for this course. So there will be four assignments worth a total of 25%. There'll be a midterm exam also worth 25% and a final exam worth 50%. So that feels like uh, a lot of weight on exams, uh, and it is, but you'll be well prepared for them. You'll have lots of sample uh, questions from previous year's exams to, to study from and to, to practice on. Uh, so it's, uh, people don't seem to struggle in preparing for the, the exams for this course. Um, I mean, if they're, if they're willing to put in the work, you will definitely uh, be able to do questions practice questions that are very similar to questions you'll, you'll find on the exam. Um, and the textbook for this course is written by the instructor of the other section, Michiel Smid. It's called Discrete Structures for Computer Science, and it's available on the course webpage as a, as a PDF. It's a very good textbook, uh, very well written, both precise and concise, um, and, uh, and full of interesting examples. Uh, so I, I highly recommend it. And pretty much every topic we do will be uh, from that textbook with a, a couple of exceptions. And for those exceptions, notes will be, will be provided for the, the course. So I will check if there are any questions. Okay, um, so it looks like there's no questions right now. Before I start uh, with the sort of teaser material, the, the teaser topic for this course, uh, introduction to some of the things we'll be doing, uh, now is the time. I'll give you uh, 20 seconds to ask a, a question that you, you want. Yes, there is no coding in this course. Um, this is really um, a course about uh, reasoning about uh, discrete structures, meaning it's a, it's a discrete math course. Uh, 
So they're really math assignments. Uh, there are no tutorials for this class. Uh, these tutorials mostly end uh, after first year, but we will have tons and tons of office hours. Um, so we have, between the two sections of this course, we have something like 12 TAs. And uh, last time I checked, we basically had people um, holding office hours every morning and every afternoon of, uh, of every weekday, Monday to Friday. So there will always be someone to, uh, to consult and ask for, for help. And some of those office hours sometimes devolve into uh, mini tutorial sections or mini lectures delivered by the, the TAs. How similar will these lectures be to the ones already on the website? Uh, quite similar. We'll be following most of the same topics. Uh, I think we might swap out one or two topics because we have some, uh, some new material that's sort of relevant to the, the current situation today. Um, yeah, material on group testing, which is related to pool testing uh, for, for uh, virus testing, so efficient testing. Uh, so, but mostly the, the list of lectures that you see there, the list of videos that you see there, Will be uh, will be I'll be doing the almost the same material. Yes, um, someone asks, should we refamiliarize re ourselves with the uh, content of 1805? The answer is yes. We will be uh, using uh, basic concepts from from discrete math. Um, so we'll be talking about things like graphs, we'll be doing proofs by induction sometimes, and, uh, and general uh, logic and, and proof strategies, so direct proofs, proofs by, by contradiction. We'll be doing those things. Uh, whether that or not that means you have to go back and review everything, um, or whether you should uh, just review it uh, as it comes along. If you're struggling with something, ask me. Uh, I can usually have time to do a, a quick review of these things while I'm teaching. So, uh, so don't go back and redo the whole course, 1805. But, uh, but yes, the, that's the, the most relevant material for this course. Yes, all live videos will be uploaded. I mentioned this a, a little bit earlier. Um, this, by default, YouTube will keep this video uh, make this video viewable after I uh, after I end the stream but there's also a video camera in this room recording this which gives a slightly better picture of the the board um, I believe it's kind of blurry in the, the corners here that's a artifact of a, of a webcam um, and so there'll be a slightly better quality uh, lecture as well uh, the other thing that I should mention is if something goes desperately wrong with the live stream. Uh, I lose an internet connection or uh, whatever, the sound stops working, power goes out, whatever. Uh, I plan on just continuing the lecture basically to an empty room by myself uh, and then the, the version of it recorded by the video camera will be posted. Uh, are all the tests open book? Uh, not traditionally, no. Uh, we're going to have to figure out exactly how we're going to deal with the fact that tests will be online. So uh, we'll, we'll see. But in general, um, the open bookness or not of tests makes no, no real difference. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the material, then, um, then you, you can answer the the questions on the, the test using the knowledge that you have and if you're unfamiliar with it then uh, having online resources won't really help unless those online resources include somebody who knows the material to, uh, to do the test for you and we'd like to uh, avoid that. Uh, there's no double pass rule or any pass rule for this course. Uh, your grade is based on this grading scheme uh, whatever that adds up to at the uh, at the end is the the grade that you uh, you get.
Uh, is having a webcam necessary for the midterm? Um, I think if you don't have a webcam these days, then you're going to struggle with a lot of things. Um, in particular, I'm aware of a number of, uh, of uh, courses, and in fact, the, the e-proctoring system that Carlton is using these days uh, can uh, require that you, uh, you have a webcam on in order to write an exam. And so uh, if you don't have a webcam, I suggest you, you get one. They're cheap compared to, to everything else. Um, in particular, um, the one I have here is less than the cost of many uh, textbooks. And so uh, since you don't have to buy a textbook for this course, you can spend that on a, a webcam. Yes, um, this 50% final exam mark is uh, worrisome for a, a lot of people. Um, I, I understand that there are people who uh, stress about exams. Uh, that's why we're, we try to make it as stress-free as possible by preparing you as much as possible. So uh, at the last count, I think we had something like 300 sample exam questions. Um, for, for people to, to prepare and, and study with, uh, of the exact same format or that appear on, on exams, multiple choice um, sort of math questions. Uh, and so uh, if, you, if you're the kind of person who gets really anxious about these things, well, you can take that away by, by really working through all of those, uh, those questions. Um, and if there's some of them you can't do, you have plenty of time to get, uh, to get help or discuss with, uh, with friends. So we, the final, final exam worth 50% is, is certainly a lot, but uh, I, I hope that uh, by the time we get there, you'll feel confident and, and ready for it. Okay. Um, so there's some questions about the logistics of exams, screen sharing, and how we're going to catch cheaters and, uh, and so on. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, Carlton has, seems to be developing uh, a system for e-proctoring and is offering help with it. Uh, for now, we picture something like um, you write an exam which is perhaps uh, different uh, for every single student. The nice thing about having a large bank of possible questions is we can actually uh, give every student a different exam. Um, so you can't just copy off a friend. Um, and we can ask you, uh, there's some uh, sort of rules outlined there about what this exam will look like, but you'll have a, a camera on and uh, at some point you'll sign in. We'll check in with you and at some point before you leave we'll, we'll sign out. Um, but let's not let's not get ahead of ourselves there. Yes, so office hours for TAs are currently being scheduled now. Um, initially, I was going to do office hours over Zoom, but that becomes a bit of a, a problem uh, because of the class size and because of the number of people who don't have Zoom licenses. Uh, so it, it may happen over big blue button instead. Uh, office hours will begin next week and uh, information about exactly how to attend them will be uh, available on the, the web page. Big Blue Button, if you haven't heard of it, is something that Carlton pays for and it's uh, integrated into to see learn. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start on some actual course material. And today is, uh, as I said, it's a bit of a teaser lecture, meaning that I will show you some of the things um, that will, types of things we'll be learning about in this course. And uh, we'll do a, a proof or two, but sometimes we'll just see the, the kinds of problems that we're going to look at and maybe the statements of the results. And, uh, and later in the course, we'll get to actually being able to, to prove those things. But first, let's start with an ill-posed uh, or ill-stated theorem. Uh, 
uh, I'll call it a pseudo theorem. And it says the following uh, among any group of six people, there are three mutual friends or three mutual um, strangers. Okay, so the first thing that you should uh, say and wonder about is, well, what do these words mean? What does it mean for two people to be a friend? Uh, what does it mean for two people to be, uh, to be strangers? Um, so I say that this is a pseudo-theorem because there's some things in here that are, are not defined. And the, the definition of friend or definition of strangers that you could uh, maybe consider is you can say that two people are friends with each other if they have ever shook hands. So expect not to make any friends for the next uh, year or two um, under that definition. So if they two people shook hands, then they're friends with each other. So that's a symmetric uh, relationship. So if I shook your hand, then you shook my hand. Um, another way to say that is P is a friend of Q if Q is a, if and only if Q is a friend of P. Um, and if that's never happened, if these two, two individuals have never shaken hands, then uh, shook hands, then they're not friends, they're strangers. Okay. So there's nothing in between, there's no shades of gray. Two people are either friends or they're strangers. I believe that the Facebook uh, friend graph works like this. So friend, being a f someone's Facebook friend is a mutual thing. Someone has to ask, someone has to accept. After that, both of those people are, are friends. And if that little transaction didn't happen, then they're not friends. So we'll, we'll call them strangers. So just to be clear, the assumptions are uh, for any two people, P and Q, two different people. Uh, exactly one of these is true. Uh, P and Q are friends. Or P and Q are strangers. They can't be both at the same time and they have to be uh, exactly one or, or the other. So uh, questions about the setup. what we're, we're talking about here. So I say claim is if I put any six people into a room, then I can pick a group of three of them where all three of those people know each other, they're friends, or all three of those people don't know each other, they're strangers. So I can basically take half the people in the, the room in this case, if the number of people is six, and uh, they're either all friends, sometimes call that a clique, uh, or they're all strangers, you sometimes call that a, an independent set. Okay. So, those words clique and independent set, um, they come from, uh, they're used in graph theory, although clique, uh, clique is, uh, is a much older term that actually makes sense when you're talking about friends. A group of people, all of whom are friends, tend to be a clique. Um, so, since we seem to be talking about something related to, uh, that, that fits into the, the notion of graph theory, let's uh, think about this in terms of a graph and maybe state a, a similar thing. So we have six people.
And think of those as the vertices of a, of a graph. <clears throat> and this friendship relationship is between pairs of people. Um, and similarly, the stranger relationship is between pairs of people. So that suggests that, uh, that the edges of the graph can be used to, to model this. And indeed, what we'll look at is a, a graph that has six vertices. And every possible edge is in there. So if I take any two people, I can either say that those two people are friends, in which case I'll draw a red edge between them. Red is a nice warm color um, for, for friendship. Uh, or those two people, maybe they're not friends, so they're strangers, in which case I'll put a, a blue edge between them. Okay. So for example, <clears throat> this person here, uh, let's say you want to call this person V, um, among the five other people in the uh, graph, they are strangers with two of them, and they're friends with the, the other two. Okay? And uh, for every pair of people, uh, there is an edge between them, and that edge has some color. So we'd have to finish this thing. Maybe this is a really lonely person. They have no friends in this group. Uh, maybe those two are strangers. That's the picture. Um, graph with six vertices. Every edge is in the graph, and every edge is either red or blue. And uh, what what is the, the theorem claiming? Well, it's claiming that we can either find three mutual friends. Uh, three mutual friends in this graph version corresponds to some group like this. in which those three vertices uh, form a cycle of three, consisting of three red edges. So there are a red triangle in the, the graph. Uh, or we can find three people who are mutual strangers, and we have an example of that in this graph, which is this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. The three edges between those, uh, those three people are all blue, meaning that they're all, all strangers. So theorem doesn't say that it's exactly uh, one or the other. In fact, and here's an example where both things happen, but at least one of them has to happen. And certainly uh, it can be the case that one of them doesn't happen because there's nothing that stops me from making a graph where all the red edges, all the edges are red, in which case I can't find uh, a blue cycle, a blue triangle, or making a graph where all the edges are blue, in which case I won't be able to find a, a red triangle. But you'll be able to find at least one of those two things. Okay. It's clear, the statement of this. All right. So... This is a statement uh, about any graph on six vertices. Let's write it down precisely. And we'll say something like, now it's a real theorem. Uh, let G be a complete graph on six vertices whose edges are colored red. 
red and blue. Then G contains a monochromatic three cycle. Monochromatic just means uh, all edges of the same color. Three cycle, this is just means a cycle of length three. Um, and uh, so any three vertices give you a cycle of length three. Um, the, the, the triangles we've been talking about in this, uh, this picture. Okay. Um, so either all, all the edges of the cycle are red or all the edges of the cycle are blue. Okay, so someone asks, what if we make the majority red or blue? Uh, so for instance, what if all the edges are red? Well then this is still true because I take any three vertices and um, the cycle that joins them is uh, red, so it's a monochromatic three cycle, just like the, the theorem guarantees. Same thing if I make all the edges blue, take any three vertices, um, the cycle that joins them is, uh, is blue, so that also satisfies the, the theorem. So let's try to prove this thing. And we'll work through a proof by uh, reasoning about the, the graph, but not drawing the whole thing first. Instead, we'll just draw the vertices. One, two, three, four, five, six. So now we're actually going to try and prove this thing. And I'm used to teaching on something like a 24-foot uh, chalkboard. Sometimes the chalkboards even go up and down. So I'm going to try and cram things onto this, uh, these little whiteboards that I have here. Uh, they're only about uh, eight, feet, uh, 8 feet across. Uh, so we'll, things may get a, a little bit cramped. But actually, that happens even when I have chalkboards, big ones, because uh, I'm not great at uh, managing the space. I'll have to be a little bit more, more careful today. So, um, so to start the proof, just take any vertex V. So let's just pick one arbitrarily. There's, there's our vertex V. Now, V has edges leading out of it to the five other members of this, this group, or the five other vertices in this graph. So, uh, V has five incident edges, each colored red or blue, and I can write this as a little equation that says red plus blue is equal to 5, r plus b is equal to 5, r is the number of red edges incident to v, and b is the number of blue edges incident to v, and the total number of edges in incident to V is 5, so together those two numbers add up to 5. So maybe the picture looks like this. 1, 2, 3, red, and 1, 2, blue, and indeed that does that up to 5. Okay, is that clear? All right, <clears throat> so um, what can we deduce from this? 
Well, uh, I claim that at least one of these two things is true. Uh, red is bigger than two. The number of red edges is bigger than two. Or the number of blue edges is bigger than two. These are the edges incident to V. Um, so either that is confusing to you or it's completely uh, obvious. But basically saying that, uh, well, the number of edges adds up to five. Uh, and there's two kinds of, of edges, uh, red ones and blue ones. So um, somehow the, the average is 2.5, which is bigger than 2. So both these numbers can't be less than or equal to 2. Uh, another way to think of that is you can just do a very quick proof by contradiction. Uh, if red is less than or equal to 2 and blue is less than or equal to 2, then red plus blue is less than or equal to 2 plus 2 uh, is equal to 4, but that's not equal to 5, and I know that red plus blue is supposed to be equal to 5. So there's a, a very short proof by contradiction. Um, this idea we will come back to later in the course. Um, this idea of saying, well, when I, when I take uh, edges or objects and classify them into to two classes or even more classes, then somehow one of them is bigger than or equal to the average. Uh, that's called the pigeonhole principle. And we'll have at least one whole lecture uh, devoted to cool things that you can, you can prove with that later in the course. But for now, I think you can convince yourself that there's either three, uh, at least three red edges or at least three blue edges. Okay. So I'm going to say something that you'll uh, see frequently. Without loss of generality, Generality. Assume that the number of red edges is bigger than two. Okay. Uh, what does this without loss of generality mean? Uh, it's a way of saying that the thing that we're talking, the things that we're talking about here, are completely symmetric. Um, so red edges and blue edges. Uh, they both play the, the same role in the statement of the theorem. Um, and I know that one of those two is bigger than uh, two. Uh, and so let's just assume that it's the, the red edges because uh, everything that we're going to say after this, we could just interchange the roles of red and blue and everything that we say would, would still be true. Okay. Um, if you don't like this, then you can say... Uh, you can break it down into cases and say case one is if the number of red edges is bigger than or equal to two. Case two is if the number of blue edges is, uh, is bigger than, than two. Uh, and if you do that, then what you'll find is uh, once you do case one, case two is you repeating everything but changing the, the roles of, of red and blue. Okay, so we're assuming the number of red edges is bigger than two. Just like in the picture here, the number of red edges is three. That's bigger than two. And we know that since the number of red edges is an integer, if it's bigger than two, that means that it's bigger than or equal to three. Right? It's strictly bigger than two, therefore it's bigger than or equal to three. And now we're almost done, we'll say let x, y, and z be edges, uh, or not edges, vertices. Such that 
vx, vy, and vz, these are edges, are red. So in this picture, uh, here is x, here is y, and here is z. Okay? So, now we have two cases to consider. What are those cases? Um, one of them is that x, y, z has three blue edges. So I look at this triangle formed by x, y, and z. Those are three edges that are not in my picture yet. And one possibility is that all three of those edges are blue. Okay. Uh, if that happens, great, because I have just found a triangle, a three cycle, x, y, z, all of whose three edges are blue. So that's the easy case. Otherwise, So that's case one. And what's case two? Case two is at least, if they're not all blue, one of x, y, y, z, or z, x is red. So it's not this case where they're all blue. Instead, one of them is red. At least one of them is red. So maybe it's x, y. In fact, again, you can use this phrase without loss of generality. x, y is red. Because it's one of those three, x, y, y, z, or z, x. But doesn't matter which one, we're about to finish, we, we finish the argument the same way. Um, so without loss of generality, we'll say x, y is red, okay? But now we're also done because v, x, y is a red cycle, right? Remember v we looked to see uh, that it had more red edges than blue edges, and then we picked the endpoints of those edges, x, y, and z, to be endpoints of red edges. So all those edges incident to v, in particular the edge vx is red, that's the way we chose it, that's the way we chose x. The edge vy is red, that's the way we chose uh, y, and now the edge xy is red, so vxy is a, a red cycle. And that's the end of the proof. Not a, not a difficult one, but a, a pretty one. And not, um, it's hard enough that you don't just see the statement of the theorem and immediately understand why it's true. You have to, uh, you have to do a, a little bit of uh, of reasoning, and, uh, and it illustrates some, some nice examples. In particular, it uses the pigeonhole principle, which we'll, we'll look at uh, later. Um, there's a, a little proof by contradiction, and, uh, and just a, a nice little case analysis. So, any questions about that?
Okay, so if you're uh, a mathematician and you see something like that, pseudo theorem or a theorem like that and a, a nice proof like that you immediately start to ask yourself uh, well what about bigger numbers so this theorem talks about a group of, uh, of six people um, what if I have a larger group what if I have a group of eight people or or ten people or uh, or a thousand people um, and if you like to uh, pick patterns what we saw was that six people, uh, that guarantees a uh, clique, that's a group of friends, or independent set, that's a group of strangers, of size uh, three. And uh, you might think, oh, well, what if I have n people for some large value of n? Does that guarantee uh, a clique or independent set of size, uh, well, n over 2 looks like a nice, uh, nice answer, right? 6 goes to 3, so n goes to uh, 1 half of n. Um, looks like that might be a, a reasonable guess. Um, so what do people think? Is this true? So uh, probably not, with a question mark. N over 2 seems way too big. No, I don't think so. Uh, seems too easy to be the answer. Um, yes, so you are correct. Um, it's not true in, in general. And one of the things that we will see in this, uh, this course is uh, it's not even close to, uh, to n over 2 that you can guarantee here. In fact, um, there's uh, some nice constructions, uh, in fact, probabilistic constructions, that show that it's much smaller than that. It's more like log n. And uh, just, uh, I won't tell you the, the details, but that, that result says that well, you can take a thousand people and in that group of a thousand people you can't find any clique or independent set of size 20. Okay. So not even close to n over 2. So it's actually more like two times the, the logarithm of, of n. Uh, but that's, that's for another day later in the course, once we've learned some, some probability. And, uh, and this will be a, a nice example of a way to prove that certain things exist without actually finding them. Just arguing that um, if you do some randomized thing, then uh, that, that thing seems to show up, even though maybe you can't explicitly, uh, explicitly find that thing. Okay. So that's example number one. Uh, this is a, an example of what's called Ramsey theory. And, uh, Ramsey theory studies these questions of if you give me something large, um, typically a large complete graph with some colors on the edges, um, that something uh, 
is guaranteed to show up in that picture. In this case, uh, it's a, a large clique or a, a large independent set, um, but not not incredibly large. Just getting you know bigger as uh, as the number of vertices in the graph gets bigger, but not necessarily uh, as quickly as the number of vertices in the graph. Okay, so um, next thing to look at is something you may have heard of before. Um, it's a sorting algorithm and it goes by the name of quicksort. It's, uh, it's a very old one, goes back to the, the 60s. Um, and it's one that's uh, used a lot it's very easy to implement and it has some nice properties uh, in particular you can implement it um, if you're careful by uh, if you have an array of elements to sort you can do the whole thing entirely in the original array you don't have to allocate a, an extra array to uh, to hold the, the, the data uh, the, the sorted version you can do it just by moving things around inside the uh, the original array, which is useful when when space is uh, is at a premium. Uh, and it's easy to uh, describe uh, if I don't want to bother about all the details of how you move things around uh, inside the the array. Um, so what you have is uh, you want to sort. an array and I'll say I'll call it uh, a1 up to a n. I know that almost no uh, modern programming language uses array indices starting at 1 but uh, it's nice to not have to write n minus 1 uh, everywhere so I'll, I'll, I'll just do that. And here's the way quicksort works. If n is less than or equal to 1, uh, well, that means you have an array whose length is either 0, in which case there's really nothing to do, or its length is 1, in which case I guess it's already sorted, right? So sorting is a relationship between pairs of things that says um, if i is less than j, then uh, a, the array index, the array element at position i should be less than the array element at position j. But if there's only one element, then you have no pairs, so it definitely satisfies the, the definition of, uh, of sorted. So if n is less than or equal to 1, then do nothing. Or if you like, just return the original array. Let's call this thing A. Otherwise, uh, compare everything to A1. So you take the first element of the array, <coughs> A1, uh, and that partitions into something that looks like this. So if I compare everything to A1, well, it's either smaller than A1, or it's equal to A1, or it's bigger than A1. So we'll use that to partition into three parts. Uh, in general, there's one uh, element in the middle that's equal to A1, and then there's some part X 
which is all stuff that is smaller than a1. And there's another part y, which is the stuff that's bigger than a1. Okay? And that's clear. Uh, it's, it's clear that it's enough to take a1 and compare it to the n minus 1 other elements in the array to figure out which things go in x and which things go in, in y. So we'll make note of that and say that that requires n minus 1 comparisons. Okay, now here's uh, the cool part. So you partition this way, uh, and if the fun exercise is to try and do this in the same array that you started with, um, so there's, that's possible, but we won't, uh, we won't do it. Uh, it's just a, a little bit of uh, careful thinking about where things should go after they're compared with, uh, with A1. Um, well, then all that's left to do is recursively sort x, and then recursively sort y. After I recursively sort x, well, this part of the array is sorted, and everything in here is smaller than a1, and after I recursively sort y, this part of the array is sorted, and everything in here is bigger than a1. So in fact, the whole array is sorted at that point. Okay. And indeed, if you don't care about doing this in place, quicksort is three lines of Python code. Um, if, you do, if you like list comprehensions in Python, you can basically do this. There's the if statement with the, the return, and then one list comprehension uh, does the, the, the rest. So very, uh, very simple uh, algorithm. And you can ask how fast is quicksort? Now, presumably, it wouldn't be called quicksort if it were slow, but that could just be advertising hype. Um, so we'd, we'd better, as computer scientists, we'd better check this. So just because someone calls their algorithm the fast algorithm, the quick algorithm, or even the optimal algorithm, uh, don't, uh, not, names don't always tell you everything about, uh, about this. So let's think about an example. I have this big array, A has A1 up to AN. And now I take A1, so maybe uh, let's I take A1 and I compare it to uh, everything else in the array. So maybe this is the way A started. I compare it to everything else in the array and I partition into those, uh, those three parts. The stuff less than A1, the stuff equal to A1, the stuff bigger than, than A1. Well, if this is my input array, it contains 1, 3, 5, 7, 2, uh, let's make them all distinct, 4 in this order then this is A1, this is A2, uh, A3, A4, A5, A6. Then after I do this partitioning, well, A1 is the smallest element in the array. So once I've done this, A1 is still going to be the first thing in the array. There's nothing in X because there's nothing smaller than A1. Everything goes over here in Y, 
because uh, everything is bigger than, than A1. So uh, X is empty uh, here, and this is Y. And Y will contain 3, 5, 7, 2, 4. Maybe not in the same order they were in before, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. Um, so I will then recursively sort X. X is an array of length 0. 0 is less than 1, so there's nothing to do when you recursively sort X. But there is some work to do when you recursively sort Y. So then we would compare 3 to everything. Uh, um, I can do that next step. Uh, after you do that, you would say in the recursive uh, sort, 3 is the first element of the array you're sorting. Um, and so it ends up here. Here's your x. All the things smaller than 3, there's only one of them. And the rest is bigger than 3, so that's 5, 7, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, then you recursively sort that and and uh, and so on. Uh, does anybody see a potential problem here? Anybody see? Uh, where things can go really badly for quicksort, where quicksort is maybe not so quick. Yeah, so we saw it here uh, even in this example, we started uh, with uh, A, and we did all those comparisons uh, to A1, and actually uh, there was nothing in X, and we were stuck with a, a problem of sorting Y, and Y still has all of the elements except for one of them. Okay. So that's a lot of work. N minus 1 comparisons just to get rid of one element and then have to recurse on the remaining n minus 1? That's a lot. In fact, quicksort uh, looks like it could be not so quick at all. And the worst thing about it is it looks like um, it might be really slow on something that should be really easy. In particular, if the array is already sorted, then when I take the first element and compare it to everything, nothing happens. The first element is there. Uh, Everything is, there's nothing smaller than it. Everything is bigger than it. We did n minus 1 comparisons to, to get from there to there. And you can say, oh yes, but it's already sorted. But we don't know that yet because we only compared things to, to 1. We don't know that this is sorted yet because we've never looked at any two numbers here and compared them. We've only compared them to 1, and all that we know is all these numbers are bigger than 1. So then this becomes the y that gets recursed on. It has n minus 1 elements in it, and exactly the same thing happens again. We recurse on it. Nothing changes. Now this y has n minus 1 uh, elements in it. We take the first one and we compare it to the n minus 2 remaining elements. So that means to get from there to there we're going to do n minus 2 
comparisons. And at the next stage, we're going to do n minus 3 comparisons. And how long does this go on for? And then n minus 4, n minus 5. How long does this go on for? Well, at the very end, we will have an array that has the two largest values in it. We will do one comparison. And then finally, uh, finally only have to recurse on this thing. And it's only then that we're done. So in the first step of recursion, we do n minus 1 comparisons uh, just to peel off one element. Then we do n minus 2 comparisons to peel off an element, then n minus 3. And we keep counting down like this until we get down to 1. So that means that the number of comparisons done by quicksort on a sorted array is 1. We can count backwards. It starts at 1. Before that, there was an array of length 3. We had to do two comparisons, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, and so on. And all the way up here, we had to do n minus 1 comparisons. Now, does anybody know what this adds up to? Uh, someone says n times n plus 1 over 2. Uh, that's the correct answer for a different question. Um, if we added this sum all the way up to n, it would be n times n plus 1 over 2. But we're only adding up to n minus 1. So it's actually n times n minus 1 over 2. Or if you like, that's n squared divided by 2 minus n divided by 2. Okay. Now, <clears throat> is that quick? Does that qualify as quick? Uh, why am I counting comparisons? Well, just because it's a, a concrete thing to, to count, and pretty much everything, that every amount, every bit of work that we do is somehow related to, to comparisons. Uh, and certainly, um, if the comparisons already take a lot of time, then the whole algorithm is going to be slow. So let's see what this, this looks like. Uh, just take a, a data point here. Uh, if n is a million, So an array of length a million is not very big by modern standards. A million data items is, uh, is not a lot of data. That's, uh, I don't even know, that's like a, a small, uh, like a really small uh, event stream for a really small online vendor might get uh, a million pieces of, uh, of click or move information uh, in a in a day or a, or, a, or a week, Amazon gets many many more than that uh, in an hour. Um, so if you had to sort those things, and this is the algorithm you're using, um, or you didn't realize that they were already sorted, and you've called quick sort to sort them, um, then this is the number of comparisons it's going to do, and that number for n is uh, a million then n times n minus 1 over 2 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 
that's the number of comparisons that are going to get performed. Now, <clears throat> okay, looks like a big number, but what are we talking about in uh, sort of real time? Computers are fast. Well, computers uh, run at speeds that are measured in gigahertz. So a gigahertz is about a billion cycles per second. So a, a rule of thumb, and, and the number of gigahertz is not huge yet, right? It's maybe they, they get up to four, uh, five gigahertz on a, an overclocked processor, um, and comparisons probably take more than uh, more than one cycle uh, in any case. But a good rule of thumb is a modern computer can do a billion operations per second. Well, still, that's almost a billion there, right? A billion is, uh, is nine, uh, is, has nine zeros in it. So this is going to be about 999 seconds. And to sort a million items, that's a really long time to, uh, to wait. Okay. A million items you should be able to sort much faster than this. All right, and uh, I see in the discussion, some, some of you have said, well, you're just focusing on the, the worst case uh, here, but on average, it's probably better. Uh, that's true. In fact, that's something that we'll, we'll prove. But what's really worrisome about this example is it's not something that's completely unlikely to happen, right? Somebody gives you a data stream, a stream of, of data. Uh, maybe it's actually time-stamped events. And uh, you didn't realize that they gave it to you already in order, sorted order by time. So you called quick sort so that you could get it in the things sorted by, by time. And then suddenly quick sort takes 999 seconds to, to run. And you just wanted to do a, a quick analysis of this thing. Um, so Yes, this is a worst case example, but it's not an unlikely one. Sort of data shows up naturally all the, the time. Um, so here's, uh, here's what we will study later in this course. Uh, with a, a very small change to quicksort, you can reduce this. So instead of number of comparisons being uh, n times n minus 1 over 2, you can reduce it to um, 2 n times the natural logarithm of n, which is about 1.38 n times the binary logarithm of n. That may or may not mean something to you, but for n equals a million, this is approximately uh, 20, 27 million 631 21. Okay, so it drops from about 999 billion to 27 and a half million. And if we use our rule of thumb that uh, you can do a billion operations per second, this is much less than a billion, right? In fact, we don't get to a billion until we have nine digits. So that suggests that this is about 0 0.027 seconds. So, uh, with that small change, you can get this time to drop from 999 seconds to 0 0.027. So, something that you wouldn't notice, um, the, the blink of an eye, uh, literally, versus something that you're waiting a, a good amount of time for, a good, uh, you know, good chunk of, uh, of time. Okay. Uh, and what is the change? The change is trivial. 
instead of picking A1, pick a random number between 1 and N, so call that number I, and uh, partition everything with respect to AI instead of, uh, instead of always to, to A1. And then what happens is uh, you're less likely to get this scenario where the thing that you picked happened to be the smallest element and got shoved in the front, and you're more likely, in particular, even half the time, the thing that you pick ends up landing somewhere in the middle half, which is already pretty good, because if it lands in the middle half, then you get a quarter of the elements at least in X, and you get a quarter of the elements at least in Y, and you don't get this insane uh, thing that, that runs away. We're not ready to prove that yet. That's going to take some tools from, uh, from probability. But uh, by the end of this course, we'll be able to prove actually this, this very sharp result here that tells us that uh, the average running time of randomized quicksort. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and maybe then a good place to finish off today is with a little puzzle. Of course, you can always just look at the answer in the, the book. So I give you S. It's a set. It has five things in it. <clears throat> Maybe the integer is one, two, three, four, five. How many subsets S1 through SK of S can we make so that any i uh, not equal to j, si is not a subset of sj, and sj is not a subset of si. For example, uh, I could make singleton sets. So this is my set S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5. So in this case, I can, in this example, I can make five uh, different subsets of S, and you can check that none of these is a subset of the other, um, because actually they, they're actually completely disjoint. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing in S1 that's also in uh, S3, but in particular, S1 is not contained. It's not a subset of S3, nor is S3 a, a subset of S1. But you can cook up you know, more interesting examples. Maybe you take 1, and you take 2, 3, maybe also 3, 4, 4, 5. Five two, and maybe uh, uh, let's stop there. Uh, one two three four five. Uh, maybe one more just to show that five is not the best you can do. Uh, let's say five three. In this case, you get one, two, three, four, 
five, six sets. And if you check them all carefully, you'll see that no, so none of these sets is a subset of the, the other ones. Um, can you do more than six? And in particular, uh, what's the maximum number of these, uh, these subsets that you can make that, that have this, this property? Uh, and if you solve it for, uh, for five elements, then try it for six elements, seven elements, 50 elements, 1,000 elements. Um, later we'll see uh, how to prove, uh, how to get the exact answer for, uh, for this problem. So a construction that gets exactly the maximum number of sets um, and, uh, and will prove that it's the, it's the right answer. Okay, so that's a good place to leave it for today. Uh, I'll finish by asking if anybody has any questions. Someone pointed out that indeed, uh, I forgot to divide by 2 here. This is just n times n minus 1. Um, so divide by 2, so it's about uh, 400 and, uh, about 450 seconds. Uh, actually, more than that, 400 and uh, whatever, 999 divided by 2 seconds. Good catch. Uh, how did I end up with 2 uh, n ln n? Uh, this is the theorem that we'll prove later in the course. Um, it's not, not at all obvious from anything that I've, I've said already. So the record so far is 10 different sets uh, for s. So see if you can beat that, but don't spend a lot of time. All right, so goodbye, everyone. I will see you uh, next class, which is Monday. Thanks.